<laughs> hold on, hold on. I know what you're thinking, right? Here's Matt Pat again, sitting on his couch, ready with some rants. Who lost millions of dollars this time? Are we gonna have to sit through some bankruptcy spiel? The shared bankruptcy universe theory? No. No, don't worry. Today's episode isn't so much about doom and gloom, it's actually about giving voice to the stories that no one wants you to hear about some of your favorite YouTubers. Because it's time that someone talk about this stuff. It's time for these stories to get exposed. Oh, and for the other half of you who weren't thinking, oh, Matt Pat's on the couch ready with a rant, but were instead wondering, why is his hair still purple? I know, I've seen your comments, friends. It's all leftovers from a charity drive that we did last year to help fund mental research. Don't worry, the brown hair is coming back. It's okay, I had my little stint with colored hair. It was fun, but it's time to go back to normal. I know my place in this universe. Anyway, story time. <laughs> Last year, we tried working with this really great PR company. Now, in case you don't know, a PR team's job is to basically know a bunch of people, to have a bunch of connections that help you get press coverage. Say you're working on a cool new business or you're launching a new project, awesome, PR teams are the ones who are supposed to be responsible for getting you on all the podcasts, for making sure that you appear in all the different publications, for booking you on the late night talk show circuit. If you think back to when Felix was making the rounds on all the late night talk shows right before the launch of Scare PewDiePie, well that was YouTube's PR team at work. So here we were last year thinking, you know, there's a bunch of negative press going around about online creators. <coughs> Logan Paul. <coughs> Maybe we could start to spread some awareness about the cool stuff that we do to serve as a positive role model for what it means to be an online creator. I mean, we do a lot of really awesome stuff here. We have big channels that are unique and somewhat educational. We've worked with 300 of the biggest digital creators across multiple platforms. We speak internationally. We have this weird online mystery that we created for our fans to solve. And we've literally worked for years shaping the strategy of some of the biggest entertainment companies on the planet. And that's not an exaggeration either. Companies like Viacom and Supercell and Lego. It's not that far of a stretch to assume that people might be interested in that story, right? So we started working with this PR team, who again, are some of the best in the business, and after trying for months, we wound up empty-handed. Why? Well, the PR company summarized it to us in one phrase. No one wants positive news stories about YouTubers. Oh yeah, and if we wanted, we could opt to fly ourselves across the country and pay to stay in New York City on our own dime, and they might be able to land us a 45 second segment on Ryan and Kelly's morning show where I could play with some slime. Uh, we passed on that one, but this is a clip of the people who said yes. Subconsciously, when we squeeze thing, it acts as just a relief of pressure. Am I putting all the water? Oh, Vsauce 3, you deserve so much better than that. But it was that line about no positive news stories about YouTubers that really stuck with me. Stuck with me kind of like glue-based slime. <laughs> Sorry. Bad joke. I thought it was funny. Anyway, related story. Because we have some big channels and we work with Google a lot, every year they send us a Christmas gift. Usually it's whatever their latest big product is that they're hoping to get publicity for. It's why I literally have 10 Chromecasts and can't say hello Google within a 10 yard radius of my house without hearing. Apologies, I don't understand. Yes, I know Google, you're listening to me. It's always listening. Anyway, this Christmas we got our box for the Google gift, but uh, it came with something a little bit extra. I'm not talking about a Christmas ribbon. You see, on the shipping label was a little Merry Christmas message for Matt Pat. Google mid-tier influencer. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Matt Pat. You are just about average in the eyes of Google. Knowing where I rank in the Google grand hierarchy is truly what Christmas is all about. Now, admittedly, I was a bit bummed by this. Like, seriously, I thought for sure I'd be like, I don't know, qualifying for the tier where they care enough about you to avoid telling you what they really think about you. So I asked my YouTube contact what it would take to get me into that top tier status. What number do I have to hit? And it turns out that it would be impossible. Based on the internal systems that Google has in place, there is a team dedicated to top influencers and a separate one that's dedicated to channels that cover gaming. 
and never the two shall meet. That even though by the numbers most of the people in the gaming tier have viewership and subscribership numbers that dwarf the other content categories, on paper at least, a gamer will never truly be on that top tier list. The moral of these two stories is this. First off, don't read your shipping labels too closely if you value an inflated sense of ego. And two, more important moral, YouTuber is a dirty word, but YouTube gamer is even worse. Here's why I bring all this up. Everyone is currently saying that we're on the verge of Adpocalypse 2, revenge of the yellow buttons. Major advertisers are pulling out or pausing their YouTube ads because of negative press that's circulating about the platform. And of course, when the money starts to evaporate, then YouTube has to over-respond to just show how seriously they're taking all these new accusations in order to win everyone's confidence back, which in turn leaves a bunch of channels and creators dealing with the fallout dealing with the demonetization and all the insecurity about the platform that comes with it. Good creators who are doing good work ultimately suffer the consequences because of these few bad actors, as they call them. It happened with Adpocalypse 1, it happened with Logan Paul, and now we're on the verge of it happening again. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why I always hated group projects. One person always has to ruin it for everyone else. But all joking aside, as someone who looks at data and tries his best to spot trends, there's a common theme across all of these adpocali. Bad press. Each and every time this happens, it's one channel, one video, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the user base of this platform being held up in the press as the example of all of YouTube. One scare, and the advertisers run to the hills. They grab their pitchforks. Spoiler alert, advertisers, there are billions of views here happening on millions of videos across hundreds of thousands of channels every single day. And your ads, if your ad agency is doing it right, aren't running on those bad actor videos in obscure parts of YouTube. If they are, that's not us, and it's not YouTube to blame. It is the people buying your ad placements. Instead, your ads should be supporting a thriving creative ecosystem that is filled with people who are pushing entertainment forward, who are connecting with audiences in ways that traditional entertainment has never been able to before, and people who are making the world a better place. And I totally get it. You probably think I'm exaggerating. Making the world a better place. What sort of self aggrandizing Grandizing Bozo is sitting on his little Easter egg colored couch here. The thing is though, I understand that because you've never been exposed to all the great stuff, and more importantly, the great people who are here making it happen. And to that point, it's time that I step in and start serving as the PR company and try to enlighten you a little bit. Cue the montage. Hit the first milestone. Uh, yeah! The 2018 Project for Awesome is here. I can't believe this is the 12th Project for Awesome. We made 60,000 pounds. Honestly. For charity. <laughs> Over the last year, native digital creators, people like YouTubers and Twitch streamers, have raised almost $20 million for charity. And honestly, it's probably a lot more if you add in smaller channels and other donations. This was just the total that I was able to put together from the names and channels that my followers sent me on Twitter over the course of a couple days, and a little bit of research on my own. But to put that number in perspective, that is enough to buy an entire island in the Florida Keys. No joke, $20 million. It's enough to buy 20 orca whales, five blimps, or a bathroom on the International Space Station. It's more than ultra-rich celebrities like Angelina Jolie, Beyonce, and the Obamas give to charity. The only people who publicly give more than this are literal billionaires, like Oprah, Bill Gates, and J.K. Rowling. And what's coolest about online creators giving $20 million is the range of creators and the communities that are getting together to make this happen. Highlights include H. Bomber Guy, who raised over $340,000 on a charity stream to support mermaids, a UK organization supporting transgender kids, Noah J. raising hundreds of thousands of dollars for St. Jude's, you have 
Markiplier and Jacksepticeye, who are absolutely prolific charitable givers, who've turned their communities into literal armies of goodwill giving, to the tune of almost two million dollars in the last year alone. Mark had a live stream that raised five hundred thousand dollars just a few days ago, which set a new all-time benchmark for him. And they're out there competing with the likes of the Yogg's Cast Jingle Jam, which in 2018 alone raised $3.3 million. And it's raised over $14 million since 2011. These numbers are insane. And these are just some of the biggest names that overlap with the people who watch this channel. What about Guardian Con or Games Done Quick, events like ZeldaCon, coming in at almost $5 million combined in the last year for charities like Doctors Without Borders and Child's Play. Rooster Teeth raised $1.5 million, and Minecrafters led by Preston Plays raised yet another $500,000 for Game Pink, which supports breast cancer patients through gaming. H3H3 raised over $200,000 through a celebrity podcast. Mr. Beast donated $20,000 worth of clothing to homeless shelters and made a lot of really expensive products available for like a buck or less at his little pop-up shop, which was really cool. And this is all just in the US. Gronk and his crew in Germany raised over $800,000 last year. And that's only the one that was sent to me. I'm sure there's tons more. And yeah, all these big guys are getting a lot of the attention, but what about the real work that's getting done by the creators in the middle ranks? Leon Hart donates Pokemon paraphernalia. Dados Destiny cross-dressed. Cowbelly TV apparently said Gucci Gang one million times to raise $20,000 for Red Nose Day. I didn't double check his counting, but the $20,000, totally legit. Others who were brought to my attention on Twitter were people like Super Carlin Brothers, raising money for Lumos. Zerato R, raising funds for Doctors Without Borders. Vine Sauce, Ego Raptor, Defunct Land and Disney Dan, Chugga Conroy, Proton John, Mini Lad, Colleen Ballinger, Katie Morton, Elton Casti, and so, so many others, all raising money for children's hospitals, animal welfare and rehabilitation, suicide prevention. The list is so huge, I can't even run through it. There were thousands submitted. Here's, here's a list I'm gonna run through on screen right now. Just, there are so many. Even the people the media hates most on this platform. Logan Paul donated $1 million to suicide prevention as part of his apology tour. Jake Paul personally went down to help victims of Hurricane Harvey. He's volunteered on Thanksgiving to make meals, and he says that he's donated 200,000 of his own personal dollars to charity. Sure, for both those guys, it might be image rehab, but charity is charity. There is no such thing as bad giving. Even the guy the media hates the most on this platform, Felix. PewDiePie has been raising money even before he was the number one channel on YouTube. Way back in 2012, he won this online contest called King of the Web, and for those of you who are too young to remember King of the Web, it was a really interesting time for YouTubers. Uh, probably merits a video for another day. Anyway, because he's so popular, he wins himself King of the Web and donates his $10,000 of cash winnings to the World Wildlife Fund. Between his work for the WWF, World Wildlife Fund, not World Wrestling Federation, St. Jude's, Charity Water, and Save the Children, he was up to $1 million raised by 2015. His cringe miss campaign since then, alongside fellow gamers, have earned millions more. And then, most impressively, and most recently, when some of his fans became a bit too aggressive in supporting him in his battle against Indian Channel T-Series for the number one most subscribed channel on YouTube, he raised $250,000 to fight for and save child laborers in that country. Now, that is truly showing some of that respect. And to prove a point, I ran the math on all the creators that you sent in, and of all the YouTubers you submitted, about 12 million of that $20 million total from last year that we calculated was being donated through gaming channels. You know, those dregs of YouTube that have been quarantined from the real top tier influencers on the platform, they are the ones that are leading the charge. And let me just lampshade this a little bit to say that the last thing giving to charity should be is a competition. It's not about how much you give, and I would never want to imply that. I just want to point out that the group often considered to be the worst on the platform is the group that is most actively giving back. And you know what? It's not just about giving back in dollars either. Over the past five years, social media influencers have granted 391 Make-A-Wish requests. That number jumps to over 400 if you add in the wishes kids made to just go to VidCon and be present at the event. No matter what genre you're in though as a YouTuber, if you're doing charity streams or raising money for good causes, you're setting a precedent.
which I actually think is more important than any of this. There are literally hundreds of millions of people, especially younger people, who watch YouTube every single day and take their lead from what creators are doing. We're called influencers for a reason. And if creators on the platform are setting the standard of giving back, of being grateful for what you have and recognizing that you should use your platform for good, they're setting a standard for the people who come after them. Will James Charles or Markiplier be on the platform forever? Popular as they are, no. Someday they'll end their YouTube career and they'll go on to do something else. But the millions of people who followed them and watched them and were inspired by them will be out there in the world and they'll take the attitude of giving back with them, whether it's online or out in the real world. That kind of pay it forward impact is literally impossible to calculate. I know it's a cringy meme at this point, but honestly, when I look at my fellow online creators, I truly am so proud of this community, just like Gabby Hanna in the YouTube Rewind. And all of that is just the explicit way that online creators are doing good out there in the world, but there's an implicit layer to all this too. We get tons of emails and comments and letters and in-person stories from our fans saying that we've helped them with their depression, their anxiety, people who are having a hard time in some other way simply by creating a channel, by making our videos, by creating a community that they belong to, that by doing that, we've saved lives. And that's no exaggeration. I will never forget this one day at VidCon Europe where after I gave a speech, a loyal theorist came up to me and told me the story of how she physically did not talk for years. And that one day she found our GT Live live streams and it literally gave her the courage to find her voice again. A lot of people come to YouTube to find communities that are like them. When they feel like out in the rest of the world, and the way that advertiser-friendly media portrays it just doesn't reflect them. They don't feel represented. YouTube is home to the communities that were, up until very recently, considered advertiser unsafe. LGBTQ plus communities, communities that represent niche interest groups or skin colors that advertisers just don't care about. People who couldn't find a reflection of themselves in a media world that had been sterilized in the name of being brand safe have found it here in digital video. So the creators who lift up those communities and give them a home are doing an incredible amount of good for the millions upon millions of people just simply by existing, by simply creating videos. No monetary donation required. But that is totally not a story worth telling, right? It's not press worthy. No, I guess not. I, I don't know. I guess I'm just confused. I mean, I totally get not wanting to sponsor child predators or a platform that supports child predators. No problem. But to my knowledge, I didn't see any brands pulling their ads from the Oscars, even though they were also a platform where Bohemian Rhapsody, a movie directed by an accused child predator, was getting a bunch of awards. Or when, just a few years prior, Hacksaw Ridge was nominated for a bunch of Oscars, despite it being directed by someone who had made multiple sexist and racist remarks just a few years ago. Speaking of Oscar nominees, by the way, Johnny Depp! He's a popular guy, he seems to get plenty of love from brands, despite being accused of abuse by his former wife. Kim Kardashian, love her, totally think her family's brilliant. Legitimately, I seriously think that they're brilliant. Brands are tripping over themselves to work with her, and the press are eager to cover her everywhere. But if we're all so worried about brand safety and the bad behavior of YouTubers, then shouldn't we also be avoiding Kim Kardashian and her family? Since all of their success was built on a sex tape that Kim explicitly had to sign off of in order to have leaked out to the public. Look it up, friends. She actually had to sign it in order for that to go public. Or, you know, you can also mention her unwillingness to disclose brand deals on Instagram, which she was accused of, and then she was warned about by the FTC, and yet she still does it. Hmm. But nope, it's the online creators out there in the world who are the real problem. You know what's not a problem? Football. Football is huge for advertisers. Even though it's the sport that's known to cause brain damage in players, some of those players tend to be physically abusive to both animals and their significant others. Oh, and the biggest team in the country is owned by a guy who was just arrested for soliciting prostitutes at a spa associated with human trafficking. Where are the pitchforks now, friends? The mass pulling of ads from the NFL until things change. Clean up the platform. Clean up the NFL. Oh, wait. That's not happening.
Even here on YouTube, there seems to be a double standard that I can't quite figure out. You know, take for instance the song This Is America, amazing song by the Childish Gambino, aka Lando Calrissian, aka Donald Glover, who will always be Troy Barnes to me. But call him what you will, you guys seem more than happy to advertise on that music video despite there being multiple scenes of gun violence, let alone themes of racism in America throughout the song. I mean, I get it, it's an incredible work of art, but if you are so worried about the brand unsafety of YouTubers or, God forbid, gamers, maybe this song shouldn't be the right place for your brand either. With so much good happening here on the platform, it's almost like this isn't the real reason why you advertisers are pulling out. Like, there's a double standard that exists between how traditional celebrity is treated and how online celebrity, online influencers, are treated. And you see, that's the real problem here. Advertise however you want, but don't be hypocrites about it. If you don't want to advertise on the stuff we're doing, just don't. But be honest about why you're doing it. Don't lump us in with child predators or brand safety issues or unsavory content just to fulfill some false narrative to justify your own self-imposed hypocrisy. We're doing good work here positive work here. We are enacting social change. It is something that our audiences of millions understand. And when you do things that force us to adhere to standards that aren't realistic and hold YouTube as a platform to standards that aren't realistic, we all suffer. We all become just a little bit blander. We all lose a little bit about what makes this digital ecosystem special. And it's just a shame that even though us millions understand it, you can appreciate it too. Because I think that's a big missed opportunity to advertise in front of. But hey, that's just, it's not a theory, it's an opinion. My opinion. Thanks for watching. Shoot, I did end up ranting. I'm sorry, I didn't mean for it to end up as a rant. But it kind of went there. YouTubers are great.